Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The text for the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on October 10, 2021, are Amos chapter 5, verses 6 through 7, and then 10 through 15. Our semi-continuous Old Testament reading is our second Sunday in Job, chapter 23, 1 through 9, and 16 through 17. Psalm 90, 12 through 17, our second Sunday in Hebrews, chapter 4, 12 through 16, and then Mark 10, 17 through 31. I got a student paper on Mark 10, 17 through 31 once. I'm pretty sure that was the text. And I remember the student, but it was titled, Dang Jesus, Why You Got to Hit So Hard. Ah, that's... Uh... I appreciate it. That's a good one. Well, yeah, we were talking about tough text, you know, mm -hmm. and this one, it's easy to preach on because we just assume that rich people are other people. <laughs> um, we're just talking about Jeff Bezos here, right? We're not really talking about, you know, us. Right. Yeah, except, except we are. Except we, we are. That's the, that's the issue, right? Yeah, you just don't fix this text. There's no loophole here to to find and to work out. It's just a text that, uh, and, but again, there's also plenty of reasons why we have to put it into context. That why is this the only person Jesus says this to? What's going on here? I, I think it's helpful to focus on what exactly Jesus asks of him. First of all, he does it loving him. That's also incredibly interesting. That, that's, that is a very important point is not to humiliate him. This is not to drive him to despair. This is an act of love on Jesus' part, which should tell us something. And it's the but, only time that, that that happens in the gospel where Jesus loves someone. You're saying Jesus doesn't love people? It, this is the only time it's mentioned. Oh, I see. In Mark. Very explicit, yeah. He, I'm sure Jesus but, loves you a lot, Matt, <laughs> and you, Rolf, but it's the only time that it's mentioned in the gospel of Jesus loving someone. And so that... I just, that is a reiteration of your point. Yeah, I think the way I would put it is that biblical narrative um, shows it doesn't explain. So it, it'll show what a character says or does, but it usually doesn't explain why. So therefore, when it does explain why, it's really important. Mm -hmm. And so usually they'll just say, here's what Jesus said. But now you're getting, here's what he said because he loved him. Mm -hmm. Yep. And what he says is not simply uh, get rid of all your stuff. It's holding you back or something like that, or get rid of all your stuff as a show of how committed you are to me. He says, sell your possessions and distribute among the poor, which is different from just saying, walk away from it all. And I wonder if that's part of it, that the, mm. the command here isn't abandon your wealth and your security, but now use it to empower others or use it to share. And, and that for some reason causes shock and grief. He's sad. But the story would be different, I think, if he said, I want you to make dig a big pit and put all your stuff in it and cover it up. Um, mm -hmm. Because there's something going on here too in terms of loss of influence or loss of, of social capital and power in that world loss of an ability to kind of play the patronage game as it was often played um, in that time. It's not all it's about, but it's part of it in terms of thinking about what makes this such a, a difficult passage or difficult command for this man and also by extension, a difficult passage for us. I think that's a really important point. Uh, and I would add to that a loss of control, what is going to happen to, you know, then he had, he went away grieving. He was shocked. This is a translation, but really sad and grieving. Uh, and for he had many possessions. And so it's this lack of control. What's happening to all of those possessions? Where are they going to go? Uh, I don't. I don't get to control what happens to them. Not only do I lose them, but I lose that agency of of what to do with them. And so uh, I think that's a, a critical aspect of this of this passage that, that needs to be um, addressed. I would urge preachers too, in terms of kind of getting a sense for what's going on at this point in Mark and how this is on the one hand, a shocking text, but also very much in line with what we've seen so far in this gospel. 
yeah, those final verses, I think are really important. And this isn't to, to skate around the, the harder part with the, the rich man. But when Peter says, look, we've left everything and followed you. I mean, tone of voice is really important there. Is this Jesus, is this Peter saying like, look at us, you know, we gave it all up. Or is this exasperation on Peter's point, right? <laughs> look, what more do you want from us? Like we thought we were doing all right here and you just keep setting the bar higher and higher. You keep blowing our minds. And the response of Jesus is, is I think compassionate here. Truly, I tell you, there's no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children's or fields uh, who won't receive that back at an incredible rate. And so part of what's going on here is Jesus is saying, yeah, there's a lot of self-sacrifice in what I'm looking for, but in the process, I'm building a new society. I'm building a new community. I'm building new families. Mm -hmm. And those families are filled with abundance. It looks like it's all about loss and deprivation, but it's actually all about this new abundant way of living. And what's interesting, of course, is that everything is repeated. Everything from the first half is repeated in the second half. All the stuff you give up, you get back, except for fathers, mm -hmm. which could be a sign, a signal of, of a non-hierarchical kind of society or one in which God is the only authority figure or something. But it's very subtle, but it's also this notion of, yes, you get it all back, everything, you know, so, and this is the gospel where back, way back in chapter three, right, he redefined his family as those who do the will of God. Uh, he talked about cross-bearing, denying oneself, right, giving up one's, um, one's kinship group, one's identity, one's place of belonging. And here there is promise about getting something back. You get back a new family, a new identity with persecutions, yeah. <laughs> well, it become eternal life, right? But then it's this refrain that we'll keep seeing or that will come up again next week. The last will be first, uh, the first will be last, the last will be first. Yeah, well, and I think that, yeah, that exchange at the end is such a, a, a critical hinge point in this, in, in this text because you're right. Tone of voice is everything. How is Peter saying it? But it's it's the also, I, the, I think the clue, one of the clues could be uh, in interpreting this um, and what's at stake here is the use of the, of the term good news or gospel in verse 29. Uh, so for my sake and for sake of the, for the sake of the good news, which then takes us back, of course, to 1-1, but also to 1, 14 and 15, which we, you know, when we started Mark <laughs> so long ago, we said that those are really the theme verses, repent and believe in the good news, repent, not, you know, uh, remorse, but repent as this, as this change of focus or this change of perspective. And so, the, so in part, I think that's the, that's the tension that's happening here that, whether Peter is exasperated or whether Peter is, you know, it, and at the end of the day, he's, there is a lack of, of, or there's an inability still to see that the kingdom of God has come near. Uh, and uh, that Peter is still thinking in these, you know, the conventional terms or the, the terms of, of his own society. And what Jesus is calling attention to is repent, look, <laughs> Uh, have this perspective and believe, trust that the good that in the kingdom of God is near. And so that's the, and especially as we're getting closer to chapter 11, uh, that yeah, as you said, Matt, this is a rebuilding, this is a re, this is a restructuring of society. And it's going to take that perspective, the good news perspective, it's going to take that perspective to be able to see uh, what happens in the latter part of uh, the latter part of the latter half of Mark. I have to imagine the lectionary committee sat around and they said, so what do you want to pair this with? Amos. And someone said Amos. And then they said, what part? And then this person said, Amos. <laughs> the whole book. Yeah. Just... I, want, uh, I, I want to comment one thing before we move to Amos. And that is that, um, you know, the, the, the part about the eye of a needle, the camel passing through the eye of a needle, um, one of the way, you know, people always try to rationalize or make, in this case, make the law workable. And so that sometime in the, in the Middle Ages, 
someone invented, oh, the eye of a needle was a gate that it was hard for a camel to get under and, and a camel had to get on its knees, right? Which is not true. There's never a, a, the, a, gate, a gate at Jerusalem called the eye of the needle, but it's, it's the sort of thing people do in order to, to try to make um, Jesus sometimes incoherent sayings uh, workable for us. Um, but mm -hmm. it's actually just, here's the point. It's impossible. Impossible. And with God, things, all things, are, with God, all things are possible. So mm -hmm. Amos though, oh. as Mark Hilmer, our now retired uh, colleague who did his PhD at um, Hebrew Union College as one of his Jewish teachers said, if you like the prophet Amos, you don't understand him. And that is, you don't really understand that he's actually um, totally uh, leveling his cr prophetic critique at you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's the first thing we need to understand is that this is aimed at us. Well, um, and yeah, and that's so clear in the first chapters, right? Woe to you, a tyroside, woe to you, the Moabites, woe to you, the Ammonites, whoa, whoa, whoa. And the Israelites are like, go Amos, go Amos, <laughs> go Amos, go Amos. And then, and then, right, then Amos says, and woe to you, O Israel. Yeah, for and three so, sins of Caroline and for four. Yes, exactly. So it's that, it's that rhetorical slam there that makes you realize, oh, crap <laughs> yeah. this is about me um and that's yeah that's the that's the edge of amos well there's now, no what that has to do with mark i don't know but go ahead well the well it, you know the interpretation here is that somehow the the existence of this i mean i i could imagine putting these texts together amos 5 and, and mark 10 the assumption is that somehow this wealthy man is against justice or that somehow his sheer wealth, which appears to have been sizable, is somehow an affront to justice. And we could talk about that. That could be an interesting sermon. What I do like about this part of Amos is it's less, you know, so much of Amos, what we like about are the, the word pictures, the, the images that, that stick with us. And here there really isn't one as much as you have to kind of guide people into um, ancient society and, and what justice looks like. You have to explain the gate. Uh, you have to understand things about trampling on the poor, taking from them levies of grain. That's going to wash over most people's head unless you describe what's going on here in terms of, I, I would think, what appears to be a kind of a, a predatory taxation of some kind. It's taxes. Um, right. And then what does it mean to have a house of hewn stone and pleasant vineyards? But to talk about what does this look like in contemporary, I don't know, expression? Uh, where, who are the needy at the gate? Um, where are bribes taking place? Well, we don't call them bribes, we call them other things. I mean, just to kind of help, to help show the way this is, a, the prof, what the prophet is doing here is exposing corruption in all sorts of places not necessarily hidden places, but things that have become norms. Mm -hmm. And that's we the, that's someone to do that for us today. That's the connection to Mark too. Yeah, I mean, I the mean, gate yeah. is the place of public, uh, it's the gate is the place of public action. So it's both the courthouse uh, and any legal, anything legal, and it's, it's also the plate place then of uh, economic transactions. So if you put those two things together, it's the court and it's the marketplace. Uh, and the you here throughout this, of course, is plural, that Amos is condemning the society as a whole um, and especially the religious leadership. So like you said, uh, the word seek in here, seek the Lord and live, and that occurs in verse, it, uh, 14, seek good and not evil. That's based on, um, it says earlier, do not seek Bethel and so forth, that you would, you would seek, one of the things people would do is seek the will of God. You'd go to the prophet and say, here's what I'm considering doing. If you're king, you'd say, I'm considering going to war. Uh, is, is Yahweh for it or against it? Or, you know, uh, so throughout chapter five, he's saying is don't go to the religious people. If you want to seek the will of God, seek good and not evil. You already know what's good. You already know what justice is. So do it. You don't have to go 
You don't have to go to some profit and, and wonder whether you should go to war or buy a field or do other. You already know what's good. And that's what Micah says, right? When Micah in Micah 6, 8 says, at the start of that passage, he says, um, like, yeah, in Micah 6, 6, you already know what is good. Uh, justice is not some um, mysterious concept. You know, it's the law establishes what justice is. Micah, that, that's such a great verse. Yes, exactly. Thank you for quoting Matt. Um, <laughs> but it's the problem with the law is humans are the ones who follow it or not, and humans are the ones who enforce it or not. And the whole system is set up so that whoever enforces the law, they do it selectively in their own interest. And that's it. Job. Oh, we should have at least mention uh, what people, uh, forget it. Nope, that's it. Job, let's go to Job. Well, here we are. If, if you're doing four uh, um, weeks Oops. on Job, what you have to do is fill in the missing chapters. So after Which last week- Which is a week, lot. <laughs> it, there is a lot. Uh, by the way, I-, I um, I, for the first time in my life this summer, I worked through all of those chapters, read through them all, all of the, um, all of the speeches back and forth between Job and his friends, which is worth doing. Um, you're, you look like you're going to say something, Matt. <laughs> Put that on my list of things. No, to not at all. I, I, no. Just read my summary. Uh, no. Okay. Um, which is not out yet, but. The, so what happens, um, Job's friends at first are fairly reasonable. Job's friends, um, who are, uh, their arguments are caricatured in a lot of the secondary literature, but at the start, each one of them goes back and forth essentially three times. So it's first three friends. Job laments the day of his birth, and then I think Eliphaz talks first, then it goes back and forth. And as Job continues to insist, I hold fast to my integrity. I didn't do anything wrong, which we all know because we read chapters one and two is true. But as he does it more and more, the friends start to become unhinged and they start then really accusing Job um, in an incredibly unhelpful way. So lesson number one, when someone is suffering, this is not the time to fix their theology. I've known a lot of pastors that think that uh, when suffering people say something, uh, that, that they think, uh, because, right, we're theologians. Uh, no, don't, don't fix their theology. Just listen to their complaint. But so Job eventually then um, says, I want God to come down. So here he says, oh, that I knew where I could find him. That is God. It, uh, so if notice, you don't get that. Today, my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. It doesn't say who his. It should say God's hand. I wish... I knew that where I that I might find God, I would lay my case before him. I would learn and he would answer me. So that's important to this. This is finally um, Job uh, after 20 chapters now has finally had enough of his friends counseling. And he asks that God would come and hear his complaint. And we're going to actually get that next week. But I think this text by itself uh, really needs to be uh, bolstered with some of the other chapters that have come in between yeah it's kind of a shame that in in four readings from job this is the only one that's kind of in the middle that that asks us to sit with job in his frustration and his anger uh it's a good text for doing that but we're going to quickly jump to not to resolution but at least a conclusion yeah next week and then have two weeks there in the in the 40s of job but I do like uh, the commentary by Henry Sun. I like what he talks about in terms of liminal space mm -hmm. and the difficulty of that, but the importance of sitting in that space. I mean, that's that's not just good theology; it's good psychology in a lot of ways as well uh, for a lot of people. But there's a lot that a preacher can pull in there, not just garnering wisdom from Job, but garnering wisdom from the larger tradition and depending upon your own place in the, in the array of, of Christian traditions, different practices that could be part of what that looks like, different expressions, different artistic expressions. There's a lot 
uh, that a preacher can do here, not to fix it, but to pull people into that kind of meditative discomfort um, that's, that's at the same time really fearful, right? To demand an audience, and demand an audience with God. Uh, we all say that, but then to sit and think about that for a little bit, what in the world would that look like? What would that mean? Why do we want it? Mm-hmm. So I want a sermon that asks a lot of questions of me this week. Yeah, I, I think I also might, I, I totally agree with that. I think I might also um, go back to the intervening chapters and uncover some of the arguments of both Job and his friends that are trying to get at um, basically theodicy. That, I mean, there, mm-hmm. there are, um, I think a lot of us uh, do operate with some sort of little pieces of broken theodicies uh, that will try to explain why the righteous suffer. Some people say the book of Job is about suffering. Others then say, no, it's about the suffering of the innocent. But I actually would think, no, it's, a, it's actually about the suffering of the righteous, because that's what's essentially Job at the beginning is introduced as the righteous. And the question is, why do the righteous suffer? Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of good material in there um, that's worth, uh, like I said, it's worth um, exposing and, and and in part to say why uh, why all theodicies in the end don't work. Psalm 90, 12 well, to 17. Yeah, we get the end of Psalm 90 here and uh, Clint McCann, whenever he writes for us, um, uh, this is rerunning a commentary from nine years ago, but it's uh, whenever Clint writes, it's always worth uh, reading. It's, it's an odd place to cut into the Psalm because you've just had the famous line that's right before it, uh, shortly before it starts, when it starts, therefore teach us to count our days that we might gain our wise heart. You're, you kind of wonder, well, what's the, what's the apotasis or is it protasis? What's the protasis that leads to the so? And it's basically to say we are mortal and uh, we only live 70 or 80 years or in case, in case of my dad, 90 so far, um, but, in light of our mortality and uh, finitude, um, the psalm invites us to pray uh, for a wise heart and then uh, to live in the moment um, with the prayer, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love so that we might rejoice and be glad all our days. And then ends with the prayer for prospering the work of our hands. I mean, in that sense, this is a very practical psalm that it's talking about the work of our hands in this day, today, in light of the fact that we're mortal. I'm not sure what that has to do with um, either Amos or Mark, but it's just a great song. Well, I might make a I might make a connection to what you were talking about earlier, Rolf, in terms of the fact that we know what justice looks like, that we know what um, we and so, but and but do we pray for that, right? Do we pray for you know prospering the work of our hands of justice? And so you could maybe bring that in in that regard if that's the direction that your sermon goes. Let me just quote Clint. Uh, in the website, he says, daily dependence upon God is capable of transforming the human perception and experience of the passage of time. When we entrust life and future to God, then we can experience the passage of time as something other than oppressive reality to be endured. Mm. Pretty helpful. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing seven or five weeks in Hebrews, you got to deal with chapter four. Well, this is probably one of the one of the more famous verses, right, from Hebrews, uh, at particularly the last part of the lection, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are yet without sin. And so uh, I, what's, what's I think important to note is that we talked about this last week in terms of the quote, high Christology, unquote, of, of those first opening verses of what of how Jesus is, uh, the meaning of Jesus and and the connection to Jesus and Jesus, the connection of of Jesus to God and what God, what Jesus reveals about God. So you have this sort of, uh, sort of otherworldly sense of Jesus, yet at the same time, 
you know, a week later, we have uh, we do not have a high priest who is you know sitting on a throne somewhere, uh, looking down, but who is uh, who is uh, able to sympathize with our weaknesses in every respect. And so there, there's the there, there's that incarnational point that you were talking about last week, Matt. Where uh, what does it mean for that God that Jesus entered into humanity, that Jesus became incarnated? And this is one description, such an important description, talking about the Odyssey and talking about you know who's who's there in the midst of your suffering. Uh, that uh, that there one of the one of the the truths about the incarnation is that God knows that uh, God realizes that, and that's the that's the real good news of this particular passage. That, that by the way, is a really helpful pairing with Job. Mm -hmm. but that is, I mean, that is one insight that uh, the New Testament gives us, not available to the Old Testament, is that. In the incarnation, God has experienced. Uh, what does it say here? Um, he He is able to sympathize with our weakness because He has experienced the ultimate weakness. Also, perhaps some similarities with Psalm ninety, in the sense that this is talking about living out days and mm -hmm. and being content. Uh, one of the problems in Hebrews is that the the, the audience is not measuring up. Uh, they're not, not progressing in their faith the way the author wants them to, and the author is trying to encourage them to uh, to stay on board and to persevere and endure toward what sometimes gets unhelpfully translated as perfection, but we'll come back to that down the road. The, um, the, uh, and then we'll go on to define faith as well, right, as continuing to persevere, even though the promise might not be fulfilled in your lifetime. And you have these, all of these great saints of the Old Testament. So here, when it talks about the word of God being living and active and sharp, it isn't just to talk about judgment. It's also here talking about motivation, uh, which is part of what's going on here. And so the, this incarnational theology is meant to spur the audience forward, uh, to hold fast to a confession, to boldly approach uh, the throne of grace, continue to find help in time of need. Uh, you know, when things are tough, it doesn't mean you just go on to autopilot or you just relax. It's, it's, it's urging people forward in discipleship. And what, what forward looks like might be different uh, in different denominations and different kind of construals of Christianity. But just to help people see that this is theology done for the sake of um, helping the saints of God endure and, uh, and navigate the, the crises in which they find themselves.